So let's talk a little bit about the, the standards themselves that, that DDEX has developed over the last, well, a bit more than 10 years it has been. So we've seen this diagram, um, this tube diagram that shows all the messages that we have developed. Um, let me focus first on this bit. Um, I'll come to the, to the other bit um, a little bit later. Uh, we're talking about uh, release notifications, that's the blue and um, orange lines, if you like, the light blue and the orange lines, from a record company via some kind of a distribution mechanism to online retailers, DSPs we call them, um, as well as um, potentially to metadata companies. Um, and that are basically two bits of information that needs to flow. The first is the metadata itself. And then secondly, you have uh, the, the audio files. Uh, would not be uh, much use for a DSP to just have metadata. They also want to have the MP3, AAC, or whatever the format may be. We're then talking about the reverse, the sales report, the sales and usage report that would be sent typically from an online retailer, from a DSP to a, to a record company, as well as uh, the, the owners uh, of the musical works, be it publishers or be it uh, uh, authors' rights societies. And the last uh, bit in this area is the communication with and amongst music licensing companies, MLCs, ReSound uh, being um, the, the Canadian one, um, and uh, yeah, how the communication works amongst all of those companies. So let's start with the release notification. The choreography is really, really simple. And that's one of the things that DDEX tries to do, to break down this rather complex uh, mesh of information flows that actually exists in the music industry into small and distinct little, um, little parts. And for each of those parts, we can then develop specifications, standards that people can implement so that we have, uh, have a better information flow uh, for that little bit. And bit by bit, hopefully, the overall um, supply chain gets better. So a record company wants to send a new product, a new release, as we call them, to an online retailer, DSP. Um, that information contains the stuff that they want to communicate. We call that a release. But also how that stuff can then be made available. We call that a deal. So should it be a download? Should it be a ringtone? Should it be a stream? Should it be for Canada only? Should it be just for February or what the, whatever the conditions may be? They can get quite complex. Um, but that's what we call a deal. But also if something should stop being made available. Takedowns, quite important. Not very nice, but quite important nonetheless. Um, and the same message can also be used to communicate stuff to metadata companies. Uh, whether that's a company that does or that deals with um, fingerprinting for, 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 um, for, for monitoring internet traffic or broadcasting um, or any other kind of metadata company can be um, fed all the information that's necessary using um, the ERN message, the electronic release notification message. So one of the critical point that we're trying to make here is that the, all the DDEX messages are statements of truth, or at least um, the statement of truth as it is known at that moment in time. That means nobody needs to really keep track of, of older messages in order to understand a new message, so they're stateless. If you, under, if you ingest one message, that will give you everything you need to know. That means that when you want to send a, a, a message, you need to send everything again. It's a small drawback, but uh, we consider that sending everything again is much better than for people to have re to remember, oh, what was the last message you gave me? And now I have to apply a delta, a, a, the differences between that, that's no good. We want to make it a, um, a, a simple statement of truth. And experience has shown that's the right way to do it. Uh, people are very, very happy with, with using that approach. Um, and the similar approach applies to communicating binaries. If a record company needs to update a binary, either because it has been corrupted or because they, they've changed an audio codec or whatever it may be, you have to send the entire set of binaries again so that there is no, no do I need to use this binary or that binary? It's all clear and, and, and there is no no arguing about it. 
So how does that message look like? It all starts with what we call a release. Um, let's call it an album release. Let's just use as an example a simple 10-track uh, album, or, or because the screen is limited in size, a two-track album um, that, that a label wants to send out. You would then describe and provide all the metadata for that album. A title, identifier, who is the artist, the, the big name on the front, um, all those kind of information. Uh, identifiers, um, as many identifiers, but typically it would be a barcode, a UPC that is being communicated. And then you have additional marketing information, including parental warning and, and all of those kind of information that a DSP needs to market this release. This release then contains a number of sound recordings. And not surprisingly enough, for each sound recording, you have the same type or kind of metadata you have for the release. You have a title, you have the, uh, the, the, the artist that is, is uh, associated with that uh, with that sound recording. You have the musicians that have uh, appeared on the, on the track. You may have the uh, um, studio personnel that's, that appeared on that track and so forth. And you have an identifier. Ideally, and in most cases, that will be an ISRC, but it could be other um, identifiers as well. And Richard will later on um, talk a little bit more about ISRC. But then you also have what we call track releases. Tracks are, or, or, um, or sound recordings are just the sound recordings. They are not by themselves marketable. But if you want to have a streaming service where a user streams tracks, you need to provide, um, you need to make that individual sound recording marketable. And this, to make it marketable, is what we call a track release. Um, so the metadata for the track release is kind of equivalent of the metadata that you would get for an album release. You have an identifier, UPC, you have title, and so forth. And then you have the deals um, under which something is made available. So if you have a 10-track album, <coughs> you would have 11 releases, the album release and the 10-track releases. And then you would have deals for, well, whatever the, the label wants the DSP to make available. In most cases, if we're talking about the download, there will certainly be an, um, an, a deal for the album, and there may be deals for individual tracks. Not all, maybe all, maybe. That, that is up to the label to decide what they want to make available. And, well, not to forget, there are musical works uh, that can be communicated, so you can communicate ISWC, identifier for a work or other identifiers. Jose will talk about ISWC a bit later. And titles and composers and writers and all that kind of information. But you can see that basically all those blobs, apart from the, from the deal blobs at the very top, all contain the same type of information. Identifier, give it a title, who are the people that are involved. And you will see that not only in the ERN, all the messages are basically making use of these fundamental blocks. If you're asking why the, the works are being inverted, so um, colorful font on, on white background, it's not very often used in the ERN. Um, there are fields in the sound recording composites that actually can, can provide the information that's necessary, but that's how the message was envisaged more than 10 years ago now. To be honest, ERN has a problem. And uh, one of the problems that the ERN has is that the music industry is quite creative in how it makes music available. There are so many different ways in which uh, record companies package music, and there are so many ways in which uh, they want to make music available, the deals that are available. Um, luckily, each individual way or each individual way to package a release is comparatively simple. And uh, we as DDEX have the, 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 the challenge to try to, to make, meet those two worlds. And, and the way we try to do that, and the way we do that, is by using profiles. Um, so what is that? If you, if you imagine all the ways you can make 
music, uh, market music as a, as, as a kind of a uh, jigsaw puzzle. What we want to describe is the individual jigsaw pieces. And if I only want to do a specific thing, I only need to read those 10 pages rather than the hundreds of pages uh, uh, that describe all of the standard. And at one stage, we had a standard that had more than 1,000 pages. Um, nobody in, in their right mind reads all of that. Um, but if you're having tens of pages to read and to implement, your engineers will be much, much happier than if they have to deal with, with uh, hundreds. And for the ERN, what do we have? Well, we have basically what we call release profiles. How does a ringtone differ from an album? Or how does a single differ from a, a, a pop single differ from a classical album with all the hierarchical works and those kind of things? And we have what we call life cycle profiles. How do you deal with updating something? How do you deal with uh, uh, deleting something, taking that something down? How do you deal with expanding the deals or restricting the deals? Those kind of uh, um, things. And what it describes is, well, how do you provide the titles appropriate for a specific profile? So how do you deal with classical titles of, of, of musical works? How do you deal with... Uh, uh, the names of, of, um, of two artists who get together, A featuring B, and those kind of things. How do you communicate that? So that when you communicate that from a label to a DSP, the DSP gets the stuff consistently from one label, from the second label, from the third label, so that they don't have to have code that says, well, if it comes from them, do this. If it comes from them, do this. That is simply not, not scalable. Um, that's what we're trying to avoid with those profiles. Um, as I said, the, the ERN is, well, has come of age. Um, it's been used quite widely, um, but we have found over the years some problems with it. Um, people have complained about some complexity issues. Um, it is to some extent bloated, and, uh, and this blo bloating... Um, caused some confusions because there was data duplicated in places. So between the, the releases and the, especially the track releases and, the, uh, and the, the, the sound recordings, well, the titles always appeared twice. And people didn't know, where do I put the title? Now, there were good reasons why it was there, but maybe that's not the best way of doing things. So um, we basically, well, not surprisingly, developed what we call ERN4 if the other one was ERN3. And the, the quick comparison, that's the diagram I've already given you about ERN3. Well, ERN4 looks like this. First of all, there are no musical work composites anymore. All the information about musical works that need to be communicated is part of the sound recording or video composites or what, whatever you may have. And the track releases have been simplified. Um, so you don't repeat the titles anymore. Track release has the same title as the sound recording that it just, just productizes and, and things like that. Yes, you still have a different identifier, a UPC, so that you have then for that track release the UPC for the track release and the ISRC for the sound recording that's in there, but much, much simpler. And there are a couple of other things that we have done. Most importantly, I would think, and that's one of the main criticisms that online retailers uh, uh, said about ERN, we have created what we call a party list. That helps to disambiguate at the DSP side who are the, the, the musicians and who are the, uh, the um, composers, studio personnel, and so forth. So when you have a John Smith being listed, you know that that is one John Smith, and, and in the old message, you just said John Smith, John Smith, John Smith, John Smith. And you have no idea whether it's the same John Smith on all of the recordings or whether there are different John Smiths. With this, the DSP knows when they're different, they have two different party composites. If it's the same, it's one party composite, and the others just point always to the same composite. Much more powerful. We need to deal with territorial variations of metadata, which in ERN3 is, is, uh, is, is slightly tricky. So for instance, 
that's the suede, as, as people in London or in England would call them. Uh, just a couple of miles south from here, they would call it the London suede. I have no idea, to be honest, how, it's, how they're called in, in Canada. But in the US, they're called London suede. So we need to be able to communicate that. That was rather unelegantly done in ERN3. It's much easier, much more streamlined in ERN4 because we simply have an element there which says party name. And then you can provide uh, three different party names, one from, for the US, one for Canada, one for the rest of the world, or whatever the setup may be. And the other thing that ERN4 does uh, quite, quite nicely, I think, is to deal with different types of takedown. Normally, you have a takedown um, after you've provided a release. The la label sends a release to an online retailer and says, hey, this is the product, this is the release, please make that available. And then maybe later on, they need to take it down. The takedown is handled exactly the same as if there is additional deals or fewer deals available simply by, the, by saying you don't have a deal avail uh, available anymore means that the release gets taken down. But there are cases, for instance, when the DSP has received the product prior to, to near end feed being established, or cases where uh, one record company takes over a catalog from a different record company, where that record company basically cannot take that product down in a in an orderly fashion. Maybe the metadata has been changed and corrupted on the DSP side for whatever reason. Uh, and in that case, we have what we call this purge message, which simply says that, re that release there on your site provides a little bit of metadata about it. Take that down, please. Remove it. And then you can provide an, an update or a, or a new ERN that then updates the site with the correct metadata, with the correct information. The way in which ERNs are typically communicated these days is using FTP, or secure FTP. It's quite a simple process, works. Um, and, and we have different profiles by which you can do that, depending on how much interactivity you want to, to have. Um, but record companies and DSPs start to actually say that that is not, does not provide enough visibility into the, each other's supply chain uh, systems. So we have now developed a web service, an asymmetric web service uh, um, protocol, where record companies uh, would provide a web server, and DSPs can simply say, hey, can, can you please give me that product? Can you please give me that release? Can you please give me that release? And the answer to that um, please give me, is, would then be an ERN message. can be ERN3 or ERN4, doesn't matter. That means that the DSP controls the engagement, um, but using a um, service level agreement, one can, can simply say, well, you have to at least ping us once a day or, or something of that kind to make sure that actually if a takedown, especially when a takedown um, notice needs to be served, that actually can get uh, through the system. So that's quite quite a neat little process. That's ERN in a nutshell. Just really quickly, what happened with the musical work information that was being conveyed in ERN3? Like what, what, how is it conveyed now in it's ERN4? The, the, the musical work information in reality in ERN3 is already conveyed in exactly the same way as it will be in ERN4. It's part of the sound recording composite. So the sound recording contains the title of this, the, the, the sound recording and so forth. It contains information about the contributors, which are then the, the people who were in the studio. It also contains an IS, a field for an ISWC, and it contains fields for writers and those the folks. So that information can still be communicated uh, through, the, through that message. So you've talked about the changes between ERN3 and ERN4. What's the timeline for those changes? Like, is that already available? Is that going to be newly available? At the moment, ERN, sorry? At the moment, ERN4 is what we call a candidate standard. So the membership has said, well, that's, that's a good specification, um, but we want to test it first before we release, release it on the unsuspecting uh, uh, public. 
so we are at the moment going through um, internal testing. Indications are, and I cannot promise anything because um, individual companies are at liberty to, to implement the standards at their own pace, but indications are that ERN4 will become online uh, in the course of next year. I would expect, again, I'm not promising, but I would expect that at the same time we would make, we should, should have the, 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 public, uh, the specification available to, to the general public, not just for the members. That's the rough timetable. Hi, can you um, speak a little bit about the database side of this? I'm not clear on um, how it's hosted. Is there some sort of central database or distributed database? That, that's actually a very good good question, and, and maybe we should have been much clearer on that at the, at, uh, from the outset. DDEX does not get involved in, the, in how the data is being communicated. DDEX simply creates a specification that then companies can use. So if a record company wants to send ERNs, let's just talk about ERN, the same applies to all the other messages, to another company, they need to um, agree the mechanism by which they, they want to do that. So whether the record company then hosts the, the, the files or whether the DSP hosts the files, that is between, between them. And it's the two companies that internally each would have the databases that feed that, that feed and take the information out of, the, out of that communication. So DDEX does not get involved in that. We do not have any database. DDEX itself does not have any data um, whatsoever. All we're providing is the blueprint for you and him and him to develop the, 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 the code to, to run your own services. There are, of course, a couple of companies that also uh, provide, uh, um, I wouldn't call it off the shelf, but they're, they're providing help if that is something that, that some companies cannot do. Uh, one of the things that the specification, the ERN and all the other specifications are very, very specifically able to do is to deal with intermediaries. So that, uh, for instance, small independent record company that cannot or does not want to um, create those XML files. They can be quite rich, those XML files. If they cannot and don't want to have their own um, implementation of that, um, often they go through, through aggregators who do that on their behalf and then send it on to all the, the different uh, retailers. And similar things uh, um, exist on the other side, kind of white label uh, services uh, where, where smaller niche DSPs can receive information from various record companies um, and be fed into their database so that, that they can then serve their, their customers.